Hi, hello and welcome to Digging Up Ancient Aliens. This is the podcast where we examine the TV show Ancient Aliens. Do their claims hold water to a naturalist or are there better explanations out there? I'm your host Frederick and this is episode 11. And today we are going to do something a little bit different compared to previous episodes. These claims tend to pop up here and there and... I stumbled upon a video from BuzzFeed Unsolved called Three Creepy, Ca- Three Creepy Cases for Ancient Aliens. And I felt that this was something we should maybe look into. As we speak, it has some 14 million views already. So let's take our skeptical eye and, well, give it a look and... We are going to actually watch this together, so you don't have to trust me to relay what they are saying to to you. But it also means that we might need to do some uh, impromptu changes along the way, depending on the mood of BuzzFeed. And if you're listening to this show, as usual, on your favorite podcast player, but feel, oh, I love to see this, you can. Just head over to the YouTube channel. It's the same name as the podcast you listen to right now and well you can see the video version instead and remember that sources resources and further reading suggestion are available in the show notes and of course on our website diggingupancientaliens.com there you can also find contact info if you want to share any mistakes or issues that you found in the episode and if you like the podcast, I would really appreciate if you lo- left one of those fancy five-star reviews that I heard so much about. But enough of me jammering, let's get on with the show. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we discussed three of the most compelling mm-hmm. mysteries that suggest the presence of ancient aliens. So, let's drop some sweet knowledge. So, we have two persons on the screen and they have a bit higher budget than I have clearly. So on the right we have Ryan, uh, Ryan Bergara, I think, and on the left we have Shane Madze. I'm already fed up with the folders by the way. Looks too official considering the nonsense that is within. (laughs) The existence of aliens or extraterrestrials has long been one of the great mysteries of the world. According to a 2015 survey conducted by YouGov.com, about 54% of America, 56% of Germany, and 52% of the UK believe in extraterrestrial intelligence. I don't find any huge issues with these numbers. It would have been interesting maybe to hear how the question was phrased, but intelligent life. That being said, history seems to indicate that aliens may have visited our world. Okay, so we have three pictures here on the screen with uh, some nice UFOs in the background. So we have uh, Petra in Jordan and we have Kukutlan in Chichen Itza and of course we have Stonehenge. Only two of them are usually associated with ancient aliens. The Petra part is a little bit new to me, at least. ...world in ancient times, aiding us at the brink of civilization. There are cave paintings like this one from Australia that may be up to 5,000... Okay, so we see here that they're going to do the ancient alien style again. So they're showing us this rock carving or painting that uh, cave painting and they just attribute to an Australian cave somewhere and that is 5,000 years old. It's a bit better than we usually get from ancient aliens but not by much. What we see here is actually a depiction of uh, the Vantidja which comes from the Aboriginal people's mythology. And we have covered this before, but let's have a quick recap. The Vandinjas are spirits within the Aboriginal mythology, as I said. Usually it's said that these spirits are the creators of the surrounding landscape and, of course, its inhabitants. When the spirits are about to die, it 
paints itself a self-portrait on a nearby by cave wall, as I have understood, and the original people have then since refreshed the paintings to restore the life force of the Vantidia. And this is just a short recap of it. It's a deeper subject that I hope we can maybe talk about in a more specialized episode or setting a bit later on but to attribute them to extraterrestrial life form I don't know it's about a little bit to rob the aboriginal people from their heritage and their mythology to some point thousand years old that some interpret as creatures wearing spacesuits or this painting from 8000 BC in the Sahara Desert that illustrates what appears to be spacemen leading natives Okay, um, so this is probably Tassil Najer in the Sahara Desert, which is a, a bigger area that has a lot of these very, very nice cave paintings. And I base this on the style. I haven't been able to find this one, especially because there's a lot better or stranger or how we should say it lives in a line they're just people <laughs> what are you talking about i'm just saying what people interpret them as it's a, it's a basket, basket of fruit how do you think that's a basket of fruit it's just a basket <laughs> of fruit on their head uh, i agree with you shane that looks more like a basket of fruit than ancient aliens i don't really see what would be alien about it Maybe it's these little people down here, left corner. I don't know. There's two, two of them with baskets of fruit and why everyone that, else. Why does that one in the back also have a little basket? And maybe it's a child. No. Look how small the rest are. Why are these so large? Okay. Here's a drawing of a Mayan carving that shows a man attached to what some construe as an oxygen source <laughs> as he operates controls in what appears to be a spaceship. Other fascinating objects. Okay, let's... Let's stop here for just a second. So this Mayan carving is... <sighs> yeah, what we're looking on here is the tomb of Pakal, or at least the lid that was on the sarcophagus of Pakal. And uh, Pakal, Pakal was a ruler of a city named Palenque that's today in the Chiapas region in Mexico. And the tomb was found back in 1949, so quite recent for being archaeological find uh, by Alberto Ruz. And if you understand Mayan art to some degrees, the lid is not as strange as you might assume, to be honest. We have Pakal, the ruler, who is dead, and due to that, he's in between at the moment two worlds the underworld and the sky, of course. So beneath him is, we, we can see here, a jaguar, jaguar uh, depict or that's symbolizing uh, Chibalba uh, or the underworld, so to say. Above, you can see the Earth 3 with the uh, vision snakes coming out of it and if they would have shown a bit more about the lid we would have been able to see the see the uh, the celestial bird that symbolized the heavens as he operates controls in what appears to be a spaceship other fascinating objects yeah um I don't really see what he would operate here and usually they tend to focus a bit on the oxygen mask as they want to call it or the nose piercing that he have there in his nose but the mayans did and the nose piercing was made out of bone and very common both in art and well among the ruling class at least as i can <laughs> as I know, but um, anyway, the Mayan like to depict people with their hands in delicate positions. That's basically their art style. So again, nothing strange here. And 
if you will look here, I don't really see what would be any instruments or buttons that they would need to operate here. And of course, the tomb or the lid is very greatly understood today. Objects include this hieroglyph from the Temple of Seti I that dates back to the 14th century BC. The glyph appears to contain hovering spacecrafts and modern day flying machinery such as helicopters. Yeah, so this is the Temple of Seti I, as they mention here, and it's in Abydos, Egypt, of course. And Seti I was the one who built the temple originally, but it seems as Ramses II was the one who might have finished in, or at least polished up something. And this is the, the Ramses, the famous, most famous Ramses. <laughs> so to say, um, the Ramses is usually is associated with, well, Moses, if you believe in that type of things, um, or at least is associated with Moses in the, the that old 1998 um, cartoon movie, The Prince of Egypt. But Ramses have another nickname, or at least among Egyptologists and archaeologists, he is called the Great Chiseler because he had a ten tendency to carve his cartouche over previous regions to take the, or claim the honor of the site or of the sentence. And it's probably what happened here that he had the set in the first cartouche uh, placed over and then he filled in his own name instead. And these flying machines and things like that have been... Well, some say it looks like a tank, but yeah, um, we can somewhat see what it says under if we interpret without the plaster or the notions of helicopters and uh, flying machines. Uh, but yeah, it's basically plaster sort of fall off from the carving from Ramses trying to take the credit for something he maybe didn't do, really. <laughs> okay. Why would there be a helicopter? I don't know. Are Why they, would they know they, there's a helicopter? Are they time traveling? So I think Shane are supposed to be the, the skeptic here. But maybe he needs to read up a little bit on what they're talking about. Possibly. I don't know. Why would they know that if less they were, uh, there was some kind of intelligent civilization that visited them that would exactly. be able to show these things. So the aliens show up, show them pictures of helicopters <laughs> and fly away. Well, I mean, this isn't the entire, I mean, this is what we've discovered so far. There could well, I be... can't wait to see the rest of it. <laughs> I can't wait to okay. see a poster of the motion picture wedding crashers and uh, <laughs> okay. well, some lava lamps. Additionally, a funerary marker from roughly 100 BC shows a woman presenting what some consider a laptop with USB ports. <laughs> okay, so yeah, this is a Greek funeral marker and the computer, as Ryan wants to call it, is, well, some argue uh, just a shallow box, or more likely, as I would say, a Vax tablet. So usually these are depicted as two plates together that you can fold, and that way you could keep whatever you wrote in the Vax tablet. And we have pictures of it from, well, <laughs> from that era. And you can clearly see here, for example, uh, uh, depiction on a vase. So again, that's just a little bit silly at the moment. How do they charge it? I don't know. Why are there USB ports on Great it if they questions. don't have thumbnail problems? I don't know. I'm just saying what... What are they looking at on it? There's no internet. Do they have Photoshop? And finally, here is a hieroglyph from Hathor Temple in Egypt. So no, it's not a hieroglyph. It's a, uh, well, painting technically. Art, maybe. But this is the Dendera lights, and they're quite famous, and they're from the Hathor temple, or in the catacomb comes under the Hathor temple, but... That shows workers operating what appeared to be enormous light bulbs, yeah. perhaps exp explaining how artists were able to see when drawing elaborate hieroglyphs inside their tombs. What do you... So... Yeah. First problem, 
how did they generate electricity, I wonder. Since we haven't found any evidence of generators or anything that would be able to provide them with lamps, cables, anything. Second part, light bulbs tend to break or need at least replacements. And we haven't found any evidence of that. So I don't know, maybe they argue that the aliens have some advanced recycling program or more likely there's what it's really depicting. So what we have here is a relief with uh, Horizontus. That's the Greek name for the son of Horus being born out of the ancient lotus flower. And the bulb, as they want to call it, um, is in this case symbolizing the tomb uh, or the womb of Nut that we can see down there too. And well, basically, and we also have a jet pillar uh, holding up the snake as uh, in this instance, Horon Somtus has turned into. Usually this is depicting of Amun, the great sun god, but in this case, it's actually not from the hieroglyph we learned that it is Horon Somtus that we talk about here, not uh, Amun that would be the case usually. Perhaps explaining how artists were able to see when drawing elaborate hieroglyphs inside their tombs. What are you drawing? Ryan, here's you with three butt cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> I've drawn it. Now it exists. Why do I have little penguin arms? Okay, yeah. I don't know. Why do you have little penguin arms? That's a good question. Here's you with little penguin arms and three butt cheeks. I've drawn it, so it must be real. But beyond these small scattered references to alien and modern technology, there are entire cities, civilizations, and architectural undertakings that make us question if we have always been alone. What follows are the best mysteries that history has to offer in regards to ancient aliens. The first- So, Dogen tribe we have covered discuss. before. The Dogen and Sirius B. The Dogen are a tribal group in West Africa, south of Timbuktu in the Republic of Mali that yeah. settled sometime between the 10th and 13th centuries. So in far. the 1930s and 1940s, the studies of French anthropologist Marcel Griot and Germain Dieterlin revealed yeah. that the Dogen knew a surprising amount of modern astronomy. According to their studies, the Dogen believed these things, all of which are scientific facts. The planets orbit the sun. The Earth and other planets mm. rotate on their axis. Saturn has a ring. Jupiter has four moons. And finally, that the star Sirius is actually part of a double star system containing a star called Sirius B that has a 50-year orbit and is invisible to the naked human eye. Knowledge of how planets orbit would not require advanced technology. However, to know about Saturn's ring and Jupiter's moon would require remarkable eyesight and an extremely clear sky. But what is truly astonishing is the Dogen's knowledge of the star Sirius B especially when you consider the fact that scientists were only able to discern information about Sirius B with the use of quantum mechanics, mm. relativity, and advanced telescopes. So let's take a moment to discuss Sirius and its discovery. Let's take me back to a different era. Um, era where the demise of rural life started, factories grew larger, pocket watch was all the rage, and newspapers started to become both common and affordable to an era of somewhat regional peace, scientific and cultural innovation, and, well, Jack the Ripper made his first appearance in on the stage. So we are talking about the 1800s. So back in 1844, a German astronomer, F.W. Bessel, discovered that Sirius didn't move in a straight line. No, in fact, it held a wiggle to it. Every 50 years or so, as he could dis uh, discern, uh, he, he theorized that uh, Sirius might have a dark passengers, if any stepsisters or murderers was involved is sadly left out of the story but 18 years later back in 1862 if you want to be precise elvin g clark played around with his brand new telescope 
46 centimeter in diameter. And during this test run, he was among the luckiest astronomers in recorded history because he, well, uh, by accident, he managed to get a clear sight of Sirius B. And this became quite a scientific wonder, of course. It was followed with a lot of theories, and in 1915, uh, with the help of spectroscopic observation, Walter S. Adams could confirm that this, in fact, Sirius B was a white dwarf, more or less the size of Earth. So Sirius B was far from unknown in the early 1900s, and in sci- it was in scientific print and even in popular print by then, uh, such as newspaper books. But note that you didn't need quantum mechanics to find Sirius B. They managed to do that, well, <laughs> quite with simpler-ish tools, but... Uh, yeah, remember that Clark did find it with a 46 in diameter telescope. But we needed the quantum mechanics and the advanced advanced um, observations to just confirm said theories. Let's continue. This leads some to believe that the Dogen were taught about Sirius B by a far more advanced civilization. Dogen mythology reportedly speaks of them being visited by a set of beings referred to as the Nomo, who according to author Robert Temple, are amphibious beings from the series. So Robert Temple has no background in on anthropology and he wrote a book that is, has since been quite extremely debunked. Serious star system. That's cool. You have nothing to say about any of that. I, I I will fight you tooth and nail when it comes to ghouly ghosts, but aliens are a little more uh, probable. Yeah, that there might be intelligent, or <laughs> that there might be life out there, I hardly disagree with, but if it's intelligent, that's a bit more vague. I would hope that there is, but that they visit us, eh, then we start to get in a different uh, territory. I win. No, you don't win. Uh, I think I won. <laughs> because I'm sure you've got plenty of other stuff on here that's very dumb. <laughs> so, some... Yeah, there's a lot of dumb things already. Let's... I have other theories, such as Robert Burnham, who believes that the Dogen could have known about Sirius B due to extraordinary eyesight. He theorized... Okay, that's a little bit silly, but, well, it's not completely wrong. Remember that... Uh, we had a 18 inch telescope previously to get a direct sight of it by sheer luck but we we do have a few other descriptions from our past especially from greek sources where different uh, author talk about a red dog in the sky and it's not marsh that we talk about because that's described in other ways in other sources but it might be that before um, Sirius B become a white dwarf, it was probably a red giant, as it's called. So it could have been that it was described differently, and since Sirius A is a bit more visible, it could have somewhat been known that there are two of them, but it's a bit far-fetched, and we haven't really confirmed this yet. As for now, we haven't confirmed when exactly um, when Sirius B become a white dwarf, as I've understood it at least. Let's get that with a 10-inch reflecting telescope continue. in clear skies, Sirius B could have been seen. Yeah, even a 10-inch. However. If this were true, the Dogen would have also been able to see Uranus, Neptune, and other cosmic observations, which they did not. Another doubter is author Carl Sagan, who believes that the Dogen's cosmic knowledge is suspiciously consistent with an informed person from the 1930s and 40s. Sagan posits that the French anthropologists that visited during that time and broke the story of the Dogen merely entwine Sirius B into the Dogen's existing mythology to make an interesting story. Well, so let's break off here a little bit. Sagan did talk about the Dogon tribe in one of his books, and he 
said that it was possible that he, they could have heard it from other people during this time. And it, it's a bit suspicious that they had knowledge to a person within the 1920s, 1930s that might have read books or newspaper. And we need to remember that the Dogon tribe wasn't really an isolated tribe. They had contacts with both neighbors and other Europeans. So it's not far-fetched that they might have encountered this out in the wild, so to say. But let's talk a little bit about the Dogon religion because I brought it up already a little bit. So we and we have talked about the Dogon religion in previous episode. And let's have a short recap here. So in the Dogon creation story, we have the sky god called Ama, who creates this first living creatures on earth and they are called the nomo but nomo change shape and turn into two sets of twins then one set of the twins starts to rebel against ama and well see we have a little bit of dark passenger connection here dexter uh, <laughs> let's move on but ama she won't have it at all and she just straight off kills the unruly twins to keep the peace so twins are an important aspect within the Dogon religion. And if they had a little bit of knowledge about Sirius A, they might have pulled, and it was an important start to them because even there it, it differs. And we'll talk about this in just a second, but uh, it's different from account to account, but it's not, again, uh, not especially weird for them to maybe then think that there's a dark passenger or a second uh, twin towards that star and it's not only Sagan who's criticized uh, Griul and Dierlin anthropologist Walter Van Beek has also criticized uh, Griul's work and anthropologists today can't really recreate the stories that uh, these two heard back in the 30s and 40s and I think the only uh, proponent today is, I think it's the daughter of uh, Griol, and that's not a great sign. It's, anyway, I don't remember at the moment uh, who, is, but it was a relative to one of these two. But again, it's strange that they would have knowledge to someone uh, in the era, but not more, since I would assume aliens might have, you know, Told him a bit extra th stuff, maybe. In Series B, into the Dogen's existing mythology to make an interesting story. <laughs> well, look, if Carl Sagan believes it, I believe it. <laughs> but he, he's just saying they lied. That's what he's just saying. <laughs> well, he's not saying technically that they lied. If you want a deeper understanding of what they're actually talking about, I would recommend you to read Broca's Brain. Uh, reflection, reflections on the Romance of Science by Sagan. And you will find this in the show notes, of course, too. But yeah, if Sagan believes it, I believe it. Don't trust authority just because they're authority. But yeah, Sagan is probably right here. Well, then he's probably got an informed opinion. He's Carl fucking yeah, Sagan. But opinion. all that said is he thinks they're lying. <laughs> well, Sagan. then Carl I'm on board with Sagan. Carl Sagan. But there's no evidence to back that they lie. I don't give there a shit. There's no evidence that they didn't lie either. <laughs> He's Carl Sagan. The second mystery we'll discuss is the ancient city okay, of Timunaku in Bolivia, a city that was high above sea level, roughly 13,000 feet. So I've come across this claim previously, and it's just simply not true. Yes, there are large stones there, but... I think the heaviest one is called Platforma Lithica, and it weighs something like 130, 131 metric tons. And, well, well it's not a small platform, uh, but far from the 450 tons that they're mentioning here. And the number seems to come from an early estimate. Uh, that, unfortunately, was just plain wrong. And, well, it's not a simple feat by any means, but... Well, it's well within reason for a quite a rich society who had some up to 400,000 people uh, living there uh, to pull this Naku utilize massive monolithic stones that weigh up to 450 tons. 
How the people of Tiwanaku moved these enormous stones remains a mystery. Some suggest the stones were pulled along logs, but others believe aliens may have aided with animals. So if you're listening to this, well, they're showing at the moment a lot of people dragging to uh, a stone up on logs. And then we have three people pushing a, a block of a stone block that's on some sort of uh, levitation platform. <laughs> Anti-gravity methods also discovered on the site were 200 elongated skulls. To be fair, I think there's actually more of them in the area, something like 400. Possibly the heads of shamans, whose heads were bound to that shape in an effort to amplify their ability to communicate with deities. I can't imagine the. So, yeah, we talked about this Elon's gated skulls in episode three, and we had quite long uh, explanation on it. So, if you want to hear that, you should definitely after this uh, go back and listen to that if you haven't already. But the short story is that the practice of elongated skulls probably stems in at least South America from the Paracas culture. And the practice has since been practiced in most of South America, Mesoamerica, but even in Europe, Scandinavia, and maybe more famously in, in France. And to say that it's to mimic aliens, it's yeah. Well, from the, the, the depictions of aliens we've seen so far, uh, I don't really see any large skull in that way. But who am I? And to say that all elongated skull then must be the, that they want to imitate aliens is weird. Since, as I said, we have a famous example in France, something called the uh, Toulousian deform deformation that stems from the practice of uh, Bandu. Uh, where they basically tie their heads of young, small children really tight to a board to avoid them falling off and hurting themselves. But it resulted in these quite, in a way, amazing photos. But again, we don't need, we don't think that this one, uh, that parents to <laughs> the one pictured here, or trying to imitate aliens. And I, I think it's unfair to say that ancient civilization must have imitated aliens because that. All right, let's continue. A pleasurable experience. <laughs> also, you'd have to do that over like your yeah. lifetime, right? Probably, I can't imagine mm -hmm. that's like a quick process. So <laughs> if you want to do this, I wouldn't recommend it. I would definitely not recommend it. you doing this to your child. That said, if you want to do this, you want to do it when they are really young and merely infants, because then your cranium is quite soft and you can have an easier time shaping it. Uh, but yeah, uh, on small, especially children, you don't really have calcification yet in the bone, so the bones aren't proper bones yet. Uh, it's a softer version of it, just so it can easily grow on, <laughs> until it calcifies and you in sense start to shrink. If I were like five years old and my mom was like, we're going to start doing something now. It's going to last a long time. But when it's all over, your head will be very long. <laughs> I'd probably say, I'm good. I'll just sign up for karate or something. I don't know. It's part of a tradition. I think this would have been quite honorable. Um, for the people receiving it. I think Shane here needs to brush up on his etiquette when talking about ancient civilizations. <laughs> Conceivably, these shamans elongated their skulls to emulate the deities that visited them. Perhaps the main mystery of Tiwanaku is what instruments the people used to carve their stones to achieve such exactness without the use of power tools. For example, I don't really get this because we heard this in <laughs> episode one, two, that you can't get this without the power tools, but it's not that hard to get a somewhat straight edge. You need a carpenter square, basically, one of these. So, yeah, one of these. <laughs> but um, 
Anyway, you need that. And we're not entirely sure what they use to carve, to be honest. That's fair. That's, that's a little bit of a mystery for us. But again, I would say that it's within reason to think to think that they either used metal because we have somewhat evidence that they had at least copper to work with here or just a uh, what's it called um denser stone so a harder stone you can use that to pound out the um, um, lighter stone and this is not granite this as it's usually portrayed by ancient alien proponents this is what we called a softer volcanic rock. I think it's and the site we see here, to be fair. There are H blocks that interlock in a detailed and sophisticated manner that require no mortar. Yeah. On site, there. I have not really seen, so they're showing the H block fitting together behind each other. I usually see them on a row, and it would make sense if it was, you know, the outside of a building, maybe. And because we have uh, carvings in the back where you could uh, probably either cold hammer copper into place to keep them really tight or you poured, uh, for example, copper or another soft metal into these uh, fittings to get this tight fit. But unfortunately, we haven't found the fitting themselves, unfortunately. There is also a calendar that some believe dates millions of years back and made by visitors from outer space for good, good measure near T okay uh, so the calendar that we see here it's actually gate of the sun they write it here on the side if you don't see it but yeah the sun gate is a bit of a mystery but not for the reason we they think at least so we don't really know the original place for the sun gate but we today you will find it in the Kalasasya in uh, Tivanako, which basically is the main square sort of. But it's not where it was originally placed. It was somewhere other on the side, probably towards Pumapunko, which where where the H block is today. But yeah, it was moved at one point and. But other than that, the gate itself is well understood. The, it weighs somewhat like 10 tons and was carved out of a single block of andesite stone, as we have mentioned here previously, which is a volcanic type of rock. And in its center, you see a figure with two staffs and something that looks like sun ray coming out of its head. And if we look at his belt, we will be able to see two snakes on either side. And on top of that, we have something like 32 humans with wings and 16 more figures with condor heads instead. And that this would be a calendar seems to originate with an English professor named Hans Schindler Bellamy. And time for rule number six. If someone used their title while explaining something that's nothing to do with it and what they're telling you is wildly different from established and current understanding, you can stop listening. <laughs> uh, but no one in the field really take this claim seriously, to be honest. And none of the proponents of this have been able to provide sufficient evidence for us to change the current a uh, textbook on this <laughs> this so yep millions of years back and made by visitors from outer space for good measure near Tiwanaku's gate of the sun is a wall decorated with heads that some believe could be aliens so this is the sunken courtyard in Tiwanaku and there's a bit of discussion among the its origin and meaning but in no way it involves alien. So some archaeologists argue that these heads are representations of the lineage leaders. Basically, here is all our uh, different rulers and we have immortalized them here on the square in the center point of the city. And I would say it's a fair point. It's reasonable, it's logical, but if we would look a bit towards the north, we have uh, the Chavan culture, 
And the Chavan has similar structure like this with heads sticking out in the sunken plaza. And there it doesn't symbolize leaders, but it symbolizes transformation uh, within a religious context. So that's the two different ideas that make sense. And again, it doesn't really look like aliens, I'd say. If a thousand years from now, someone was like, wow, have you ever seen signs? Signs, the motion picture that they made back in the day? They found aliens. It was crazy. Okay, they so ruined a kid's birthday party. You're talking about a civilization that is us now that is able to perceive advanced art and like expression in that way. They, we could separate reality from not reality. Yeah. Know? What I'm positing is I don't know if they had that capability back then, especially in the cave you paintings. You don't think one. back then? In they, the cave painting ones, you think You don't think they were created? <laughs> my, my big takeaway here is that art is not proof. <laughs> I agree with you, Shane. And again, this notion that they could not understand them. Okay, sure, they might not be able to understand how it worked or anything, but they would still have a vocabulary and artistic uh, measures to, you know, depict it as they see it. Uh, but yeah, art is not really proof in this case, at least. <laughs> okay, sure. The third mystery is arguably the strongest indicator of ancient aliens the Pyramids of Giza. The three <laughs> Giza pyramids were constructed between 2550 and 2490 BC in Egypt. They were built as tombs for the pharaohs meant to emulate and honor the gods. The first and largest pyramid also were- right. So, I think there's a little bit room this was anticipated, to be fair. Well, <laughs> so, Let's talk a little bit about burials in ancient Egypt. So from Ryan here, it seems as he thinks at least the Khufu or Cheops pyramid just materialized one day out of nothing, but nothing could really be further from the truth. So first of all, this was not the first pyramid in Egypt, nonetheless, but the burial tradition in ancient Egypt Egypt do start with quite simple sand pits, uh, simple affairs, and um, probably where the Egyptians got the ideas for mummification later on. So sand pit graves have this little drawback that, well, the sand can blow away and reveal the, the grave underneath. And if you bury something in a dry, um, in a dry environment and hot, you get this natural sort of mummification. And from there, we, we start to have an um, evolution of the grave. So the royal, royal graves in Egypt have always been quite elaborate, but in different ways. Early on, the royal grave complex was usually two or more sites. With a temple, you even have a fortification. You usually have these separately. Uh, over a quite huge dis dis distance separately. But the burial was usually on a small hill with a mastaba on top. So mastaba is a structure that's rectangular in shape and comes from the word mastaba comes from the Arabic word for bench. But from there, we start to see more elaborate, bigger mastabas and they start to put mastaba upon <laughs> other mastabas. And unfortunately, these were made out of mud bricks, so not much are left of them today. But it was all about to change one day where Netzirkiret, or Djoser, as he is more commonly known, would revolutionize the royal tomb market, or, well, he's physis physician, or, well, priest, poet, and or architect, known as Imhotep. Uh, did revolutionize this. If we would describe Imhotep, he is unfair to Imhotep, but maybe we would, you know, compare him to Leonardo da Vinci. I would rather see Leonardo da Vinci being the Imhotep of his time, but uh, dig digressing. <laughs> but this pyramid that he built was on six levels and 60 meter high. And it was the start of something great. It was unstable, but again, it was the first attempt at a pyramid, the step, the step pyramid, 
But the good thing about the pyramid is that the weight go inwards. So you, even if you don't properly succeed, you can still have it standing up just by pure design. Which, of course, if you want to build something tall, you choose a pyramid shape because it's the easiest shape to build. And from there, nothing did, didn't really happen within the pyramid building for a little bit at least. But again, we would see a change in that too when uh, Sneferu come to power. So he's quite a character, Sneferu. We have some stories uh, coming down through the histories about him and he seems to be a quite approachable guy. And from uh, how they speak about him later, uh, we also see that he's quite revered within the Egyptian society. Pharaohs tend to say later that nothing as good has been done since the reign of Sneferu. So, well, he was a big deal for the ancient society, but he tries to do a seven floor step pyramid but then he decides to start to try to fill in you know the the steps to try to get the true pyramid form but for different reasons he abandons this project and he then want to move his tomb to Dashur for some reason that's closer to Saqqara then and the pyramid has been recycled for other projects and there's nothing really left of it today. Today is basically just a husk of a pyramid standing in the desert. But the attempt towards the true pyramid was, well, as you start to notice, not without its problem. So we have after that the bent pyramid and it started out with a 54.5 degree slope and it was quite smart, but they did something of a rookie mistake as you can see here it doesn't really look look great because when you you want to build a pyramid you want all sides of it to be on solid bedrock and they learned the hard way here that they accidentally got one of the sides or corners on gravel so when the gravel settled it started to collapse inside on top of each other and if you would be allowed to walk in you're not, but because it's very, very dangerous, but you would be able to see big cedar beams trying to support the structure up because, well, it's, you know, imploding on itself. But instead of uh, abandoning it completely, they actually finish up it, but with a steeper slope, just the same material and time. And then they didn't give up yet. He has built two pyramids. His time is starting to run out, but he's giving it a last attempt. And this time he does finish it. And it's called the Red Pyramid. And you find that in the short too. And it has the 43 degree slope that we, well, associate with pyramids in Egypt that we love and know. Referred to as the Great Pyramid was built around 2550 BC for the Pharaoh Khufu and is around 481 feet tall. Mm -hmm. Each side of the pyramid was 756 feet, and the area of each side is 5.5 acres. The angles at the base of the pyramid are nearly perfect 90 degree angles. Yeah, yeah. All of this suggests the architects had a high understanding of mathematics. Mm -hmm. That being said, mm -hmm. here are some things that make me question who or what those mm -hmm. architects may have been. You're telling me those architects used math? I'm not so, Let's break this down. So the pyramids were built by the people of Egypt, not slaves, as many still believe, even if it's very, very much untrue. But it's due to what made Egypt so great is that it could produce a big chunk of harvest, especially wheat. And why was this? Well, it's due to inundation that, well, previously at least happened every year. So every year, the banks of the Nile would overflow with this new nutritious soil from the river. And it made um, our ground more fertile and it could 
really have this higher yield in harvest, which why it was known as uh, the breadbasket of the Mediterranean, basically. But it, the inundation also means that they each year had a quite large workforce that couldn't really do anything since their farms were <laughs> were uh, flooded, basically. So they could construct then for building projects and other things. And how do we know that it was free labor? Because we actually do have records of what they were fed and paid. So they got they got something like four liters of beer every day. They, got wheat, they got onions, uh, even meat. So they were well fed. And if they died, they were to be buried close to the pyramid, which back then was quite an honor. This is before, well, uh, reincarnation or what we should call it, resurrection was part of uh, the more <laughs> for the broad masses. So in the old kingdom, there's this pyramid was a part of uh, resurrection wasn't really for the commoners it was for the pharaoh the god who were able to resurrect but you could think that maybe if you were buried close enough to him you would you know resurrect by proximity uh, but later it would change during the middle and of course um, <laughs> the latest kingdom and uh, then it was more for everyone and we also found papyrus scroll kept by a man named Inspector Murrer, and he was in charge of the barges shipping limestone uh, to the site of Khufu's pyramid. And it gives us a quite fantastic insight to the building process, and you can even read it yourself online if you're interested in that. But to the claims, we don't really know how many stone were used, probably less than 2.3 million. We have to remember that they use part of the bedrock underneath to, you know, get a little bit higher up so you don't need to use as much stone. And we have evidence that it seems as they filled out parts of uh, the pyramid with sand and rubble to, again, same material. So probably less. And yes, the stone weighs something like uh, 2.5 to 14 tons. But remember that the heavier stone is in the bottom and, well, short. 2.5 ton is still quite a lot, but it's not as they put the heaviest stone on top because that wouldn't make sense. And well, the, um, the 23 years beat strength since uh, who for rain for 28. Sure, I don't think he started, you know, dragging stones day one when he's on the throne, but yet yeah, 23 sounds a bit off. To be honest, and there's been estimates that a workforce of 10,000 10, men will be able to complete this task without any big issue. So again, remember, they had a large workforce to work with and they didn't have high mathematics as they're talking about here, but they were very, very organized. Down with a feather. <laughs> <laughs> I'm suggesting, and some people are suggesting that perhaps it was a little too advanced. Based That's on. so disrespectful. <laughs> I can't agree. <laughs> the Great Pyramid was constructed of roughly 2.3 million stones, each weighing between 2.5 to 15 tons. In order to finish the Great Pyramid in 23 years, the workers would have to set a block every 2.5 minutes every day of the week. The Egyptians did not have wheels, pulleys, or work animals. So how could they have lifted and transported these enormous stones with that kind of efficiency? Can you imagine if you spent your entire life hauling around heavy stones and someone was like, oh, well, they couldn't have done it. You know what no. it must have been? Space aliens. I seen them. Every 2.5 minutes, one block, every fucking day of the week uh, for 23 had, years straight. Could have had hustle days. I'm just saying, it doesn't matter how many slaves they were if they didn't have oh, the tools to well. do it. Again, we have this slave. Yeah, Ryan. Um, yeah, Shane is onto something here. But Ryan, you, you need to... <sighs> start to research a little bit better and yeah Shane the ancient alien theorists they do like to rob people of their achievements definitely and Ray Ryan as I said maybe you should try to research a bit better because well they're not being able to drag these stones well let's 
I know a few people that would disagree, like the nearest people here. They clearly didn't get the memo. They seem obviously fine dragging big ass stones. And also in this video, we can see how the same tribe did it. Sure. Is it easy? No. But again, it's really possible. Facts don't matter then. No, I'm saying they didn't have the tools. That is facts. Some have suggested a ramp structure, but it would have had to be massive and no evidence of this construction has been found. If I'm building a giant, <laughs> mighty, wondrous thing, I'm not going to be like, hey, can you do some chiselings of uh, the ramp? We really got to show off the ramp. <laughs> the hell of a ramp. Are there blueprints for the pyramids? I'm sure there is. They had all the mathematics and things broken down. Are they written mm. in alien language? Oh my God. Additional. Okay. okay, so for the ramp part, for lower pyramids, yeah, a single ramp would probably done the trick. But as they grew higher, at least for at least <laughs> Cheops pyramid, a single ramp might have been a bit too much. It would have been a bit extreme angle. So either it could have been single ramp up to a certain point and then they switch to a ramp around. But that way it would have been tricky to get it really exactly leveled. But something that's been proposed by well a French architect is that they had a ramp inside. So instead of having the ramp outside obscuring the view for the architects they had it inside but we haven't been able to completely confirm it it's been scans of the pyramid early on but the egyptian uh, antiquity board haven't really given um, any allowance to closer examine the pyramid to see if there's actually a ramp inside but i find that theory well plausible at least and for them, for them, how the pyramid takes, no. <laughs> and again, you don't need higher mathematics for this point. Um, but some things the Egyptians never felt like being important enough to write down, or maybe that's why they didn't really write it down. So it was preserved. But for example, how to build a temple. We have no records on how they did it by themselves. How to mummify a person, again no records or how to build the pyramids so maybe it's something that you know the architect wanted to keep it within the family so you just told your son and and so on and so on so you didn't really write it down in that sense plausible some sort of company secret basically or it's just didn't survive for a reason uh, so for some time, the capital of the records were up in the Fajun, up in the Delta, which is very, very mushy, <laughs> mushy soil. And a lot of water is very, very hard to excavate up there because of that. But also written paper papyrus don't really survive up there in that sense. But again, you don't need high mathematics to really pull this off. That's why you build a pyramid, because again, it lean on itself. It's quite easy to build in that sense. The Great Pyramid is perfectly aligned with Magnetic North. It is unknown how the Egyptians could possibly have known. So finding North is very simple. You need one stick, you need two stones and about 15 minutes of time. And you can easily find the North End. Even if they didn't know exactly how long time they needed, uh, it would have been able to come down from uh, from generations uh, doing that. You can do it in other ways too, using stars and other things. So, of course, they can find a magnetic north. On this, though some theorize it had to do with observing the cosmos. The perimeter of the Great Pyramid when divided by twice the height allegedly results in the number pi, up to its 15th digit. Wow. This may also demonstrate a suspicious knowledge of mathematics. No. The pyramids of Giza are also considerably well preserved in comparison to other pyramids <sighs> around the world, despite the pyramids of Giza being centuries older. Sure. Some have claimed this is due to the fact that they were upkept over the past hundreds of Could years. Be though others believe it is a sign of unearthly preservation. So I don't think, know if any of you remember, but back in the day, especially 
when Van Daniken was all the rage, <laughs> um, there was this belief that things would preserve longer if you put it under a pyramid for some reason. So if you put a razor blade in a pyramid shaped thing, it would never go dull. And if you put food in a pyramid shape, it wouldn't really go bad as quickly. For the ancient Egyptians, this would have been just pure silly. The pyramid wasn't whole in that sense towards them. It was, well, <laughs> something convenient. Of course, it then morphed into a symbol, but saying that pe- things would, you know, preserve better in a pyramid shape, the Egyptians would have sort of laughed at you <laughs> too for that. <laughs> Finally, the three pyramids align with the pattern of Orion's belt, a fact that some consider an impossible mm. feat for the Egyptians to accomplish. So the Orion belt or the Orion correlation theory as uh, Robert Baval or French Lex Luthor, I like to call him, uh, or Robert Hancock too for that sense, propones, well, theory is the pyramids would match the Orion's belt perfectly in alignment, except of course it doesn't really do that since the stars isn't where they are now compared to a thousand years ago and even longer in that case and he haven't really accounted for that at all plus well the pyramids they have a little piece of them going a bit was it towards the um, uh, towards the south, while the Orion's belt, little one of the stones, are a bit higher up, it goes to the north. So again, it doesn't really fit if you don't really flip it as he did in his book. And he's very upset if you point that out, because <laughs> of course he is. He's built a career on basically inventing stuff. And he will claim that everything that comes in a line of three is due to the Orion correlation theory because aliens did it no matter what so anything in three doesn't matter really <laughs> unless of course they were building based on instructions i don't that's, doubt that they were mathematically adept well the other two weren't math the magnetic north and again magnetic north they could just <laughs> <observe this. laughs> yeah basically i don't know <laughs> so it was aliens <laughs> yes yeah, so they it showed was, up so it was aliens gave them ipads <laughs> gave them a zoom built the pyramids, <laughs> left, and that's it. Sure, yeah, all those things in that order. And they haven't Except been back the since. Moon. They haven't been back since. Yeah. Yeah, they were like, fuck humanity. What we covered are only some of the ancient mysteries that inspire wonder and curiosity of our place in the so universe. The top. And as with most stories that deal with the existence of extraterrestrials, the answer is never definite and always left to personal interpretation. Were we visited and aided by aliens in ancient no. times? Do aliens even exist? The answer for now remains unsolved. No. <laughs> it's very not solved <laughs> or unsolved. I think they lied. I have yet to see any compelling uh, evidence. I thought that was compelling unless, you, of course, they lied. You think a lot of things are compelling. I felt that very compelling. Go fuck yourself. Have a nice day. All right. Okay. So am I impressed? <laughs> no, not really. I'm not really sure if it's better or worse than ancient aliens well ryan seems to have done a half-hearted attempt in research or sure they work with what 13 12 minutes something like that so of course they can't really deep dive as ancient aliens does but um yeah sure yeah i give them is refreshing to have the skeptic and the believer concept even if i think that shane maybe needs to be more read up to really do that position any good since it's hard to argue against a believer without having any ground to stand up that's been one of the reasons i started this show basically to be able to maybe give some context to the different things that they like to discuss and um, a tribute <laughs> to aliens and if you want to read a great book about uh, these type of claims i can really recommend this one uh, frost myth and mysteries by kenneth fader archaeology professor 
and it has everything you need to really dig a bit deeper in this. And it's very handy to have if you hear something. You can look up most of things that they bring up in this book. Uh, anyway, enough commercial. This was totally unsponsored too. <laughs> Just so you know, I'm not getting paid. But you will find all info in the show notes if you want to find that book later on. But I would give these two a uh, 3 out of 10 mostly for the production value was good filming good graphics everything like that but the research oof, um, they need to do better there looks like the you Shane yeah I'm talking to you anyway they at least have room for improvement that's something you can always go up that's the best <laughs> Okay, but uh, remember to leave a positive review anywhere you can, such as iTunes, Spotify, or to your body at the trench. If you watch this on YouTube, you should also press the like and subscribe button, and don't forget the little notification bell. I would also recommend you to visit diggingupancientaliens.com, where you can find more info about me and about the podcast. You will, of course, find me on most social media sites, and if you have comments, corrections, or suggestions, or just want to write a email in all caps you find all my contact infos on the website until next time keep shoveling that science Thank you for tuning in and listening to this episode. Remember that we have a subscription going on. You can become a patron or other subscriber for as little as $2.50 per episode. Go to diggingupancientaliens.com slash support. That is, go to diggingupancientaliens.com slash support to read more information and sign up right there.